Shit's gone sideways. Oh. Brilliant. Well, Craig, thanks so much for coming on Shit's Gone Sideways. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Andrew. It's a, it's a cool name. Yeah. Yes. Well, I mean, it's just I, – I think I've spoken about it on this podcast before, but I tried to come up with a name that wasn't already taken. And so, um, you know, one's like um, – when life gives you lemons, or uh, up shit creek, and all these other ones mm. were already taken. So my, my first like five or six preferences weren't taken, and then I searched uh, shit's gone the sideways. Nothing there. I'm like that's done. It's very Australian. So yes. yeah. <laughs> so where did you grow up? I uh, grew up in South Africa. Yes. Um, you can probably hear from the accent. Yes. It's not as strong as some, but yes. uh, yeah, I grew up in Johannesburg in South Africa. Yep. Um, so I'm 58 years old. Yes. So born in 1965, just had a birthday. Um, Big family? Um, I'm the eldest of three. Yeah. So um, I, um, I'm, my sister's two years younger than me and I have a brother who's 10 years younger than me. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. My father uh, was an accountant, chartered accountant. My mother was um, a stay-at-home mum. Yeah. Or mom, as we say. <laughs> <laughs> But I've learned to say mum. And how long did you live in Joburg for? Uh, I lived in Joburg all my young life. Yeah. Um, and um, met my wife there. Um, and uh, we got married in 1990. So I was quite young, 25. Um, and soon after we got married, we moved to go live in Cape Town. Yeah, okay. So we moved down to a coastal city. In what, what was it like growing up in Joburg? Uh, Johannesburg... Look, I, I suppose you need to put it in context uh, when you understand it, a lot of people don't know what apartheid is yes. or was. Yes. Okay. So um, apartheid was a, um, a government policy, uh, a racist policy in South Africa uh, where um, anyone who wasn't white was treated as a second-class citizen, and this was legislated. So the difference between what happened in South Africa and what happened in other parts of the world is that in other parts of the world, yes, there were racist policies, but they weren't put into writing, writing and into legislation. And so you were growing up right in the middle of this? Yeah, so I grew up in South Africa, yeah. but it was normalized. Yeah. You know, we, we just thought that that was the way it, were, mm. it was. And, you know, you were an average middle-class family, but you had one or two servants, for mm. want of a better term. Yeah. Um, most of the time they would live on the property, but not, in your house, there was always uh, quarters outside where the, where, where the servants would live, and I use it, that term because that was the term we used at the time. And um, they were kind of members of the family until you didn't want them to be members of the family. Um, there was no secure appointment, a uh, very basic wage. Yeah. Um, and that's how, you know, South Africa was, you know, it was a whites only country, and uh, toilets were whites only, and or, and then there were toilets for the non-whites, as they call them, yeah. buses, the same. It was, you know, it was a separate society. Um, it was also an extremely conservative society. So um, it was um, Christian fundamentalist society. That's the way the government was run. Um, we didn't get television in South Africa until 1975, yeah. uh, and that was largely because television was seen as a medium to transmit evil. <laughs> um, uh, no, that's literally what was said. It was you know, meanwhile apartheid's going on. And apartheid's going on, but you know what, what I mean by evil is uh, evil in the sense of uh, um, uh, sin and yeah. um, uh, pornography. Yes, I mean, novels like Lady Chatley's Lover were were banned. Mm. Um, any kind of pornography was completely banned. You couldn't buy. You couldn't buy. You know, if anybody got hold of a, a Playboy mm. magazine, it was smuggled in in somebody's suitcase underneath <laughs> the clothes or something along those lines. Yeah. Um, you know, drugs just was hardly known at that time. Mm. Um, basically, it was marijuana. Mm. Um, some of the best in the world was grown down in near Durban. I was going to yeah. say, how did teenage boys have fun <laughs> under these circumstances? Uh, how did you have fun? Uh, you played sport mm. and uh, occasionally you drank beer mm. and uh, – and that was it. Or you hooned around in cars. It was very, in hindsight, it was really, really boring. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, and, yeah, very conservative society. And if you didn't fit in with the mold, right, yeah. so um, if you were gay or if you, um, 
you had uh, ideas that were outside the norm, um, society frowned upon you. And uh, you, know, you just had to stick to this very Calvinist kind of approach to life. Were you grow, grow, brought up, uh, I guess, in that apartheid culture of um, also thinking less of black people? Yeah, yeah. that's what we were brought up. Yeah. We were brought up to, to, to think that they were second-class people. Mm. Look, um, as I grew up and got all, you know, moved towards my late teens and went to university, I suddenly realized that this was an abhorrent um, system. Mm. And when I got to university, it was, um, uh, it was a very liberal. This was probably the most liberal university in South Africa at the time. And I got involved with in protests. Okay, so a lot of people your age that also shared your views, right? That yeah, was, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But we would sit, you know, by protests, I mean, we would literally sit in the street and the police would then chase us down and beat us and, well, I managed to get away. Did you have to be guarded about who you shared those views with or did you just you to get a sense of someone before you? I, I don't know so much. I mean, I, I suspected that I was probably photographed and, you know, standing in a demonstration, mm. maybe identified, but that didn't stop them conscripting me into the army. I mean, we were all conscripted into the South African army. And um, so, you know, I went to the army and it was, the army was an education, yeah. two years that, that I had to go. How did it feel when you got the news that you were being conscripted? Well, we knew we had to go eventually. Yeah. yeah. So kind of people try to get out of it and, uh, those who wanted to, and there were those who didn't. So I, I could speak for, you know, hours about the adventures in the army. Um, but, you know, safe to say that I got posted, I got a very good posting that I managed to organize, a little bit of wheeling and dealing. Yep. And um, I landed up editing what was then a little newspaper that went to the South African army people, to the, the armed forces, so to speak. Um, and it, it turned out to be a very... Um, a, a very neat little job to have. Uh, we got into trouble. Um, Why? <laughs> so it was, it was not approved by... The... No, so, so th this little newspaper was running and it was running out of money yeah, more okay. than anything else. And we thought, well, if it runs out of money, we're going to get posted to some... Um, and I suppose say we because we, we, a collection of us with similar views uh, were in... Got, we would get posted to this newspaper. If we got run out of money, we would um, be sent to some awful place to, to complete the rest of our service. Right. So we went, you know, cap in hand, and we went to some big companies, and we said, well, if you give us money, like a South African bank, if you give us money, we'll, uh, we'll kind of freely advertise to, for, on your behalf to you know, young soldiers. And this was a great time for banks to grab them because they were young, they were just starting to earn, mm. and, you know, you'd have them for life kind of thing. So... We managed to get some money that we became financially independent of, of the army. Right, okay. So so that gave us, made us a little bit, we were a little bit cocky. I was going to say, did that give you more uh, editorial freedom <laughs> well, in it, your mind at least? It did for a while. Um, <laughs> so we decided we wanted, you know, the, the stories that were in the newspaper was like this, this major has now been promoted to a colonel and this, um, you know, there's a new toilet block at the one army base. It was really boring nonsense. Yeah. So we went, decided, well, what do young, you know, young men want to see in, in a newspaper, right? They're stuck on bases. And so we went to the, like the movie companies in South Africa and we got free tickets and we reviewed movies. I mean, we were journalists. Yeah. But we would review the movies and I went to the record companies. Those days you had vinyl, right? So I don't know if people know when listening to the podcast what a vinyl is. You know, it's a big round black <laughs> record, as we used to call them. Um, and I would get records and I would review them. Mm. Um, and, of course, what we wanted to see was they also wanted to see girls, right? Yes. So uh, – Sounds yeah. like this is turning into the South African version of Playboy. <laughs> well, not really, but, I mean, we didn't have any money uh, to, to hire models or whatever, but we had a photographer on staff. So we were based in, in Pretoria, which was the executive capital of South Africa, and we went out at lunchtime and uh, onto the streets and we would 
find a girl and say, well, do you want to be in the newspaper? Um, and she would, they were, of course, say yes, and it would be a little bit famous. And uh, we would arrange for her to come in her swimming costume <laughs> <laughs> the next day, and we would pick her up and take her somewhere, take photographs of her and stick her in the newspaper. So, so, yeah, was it, whose job was it to say, oh, would you like to be part of a photo shoot? By the way, bring your swimmers. <laughs> well, I, that's where I, me and the photographer would go out and we'd do this. And, I think the one day when we started to get into trouble, this is when we started to get into trouble, was we found a girl uh, who was not who was not white. Okay? Mm. She was not 100% white. Now, in South Africa, there was a big issue at the time. People don't understand it now, but it's, it was a big issue. Um, she was a beautiful girl, and we didn't see her in terms of color. We just thought she was a beautiful girl. Yeah. So we said, do you want to be in Newsbury? She said, yes. Wow. So told her the same story. Bring your swimming costume. We'll pick you up the next day. And um, We did. And we drove out to um, – there was a, 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 a an army base just outside Pretoria that had this big old tank at the front of the base. And we got her to climb up on the tank. And she had a costume on And to be honest, it was a – when we saw what she was wearing, the swimmers, it was a very small bikini. Very revealing. Yeah, yeah. a little like crocheted knitted thing. And um, she got into it and she draped, you know, she lay all over the tank and we took pictures and we published them. And then we just started to get like, seriously, we are poisoning the minds of these young men and corrupting them and how did we find this picture and – you know, it just it Fuck. was. We got into big trouble. Yeah, for for shooting a mixed race girl on a tank. Yeah, yeah. yeah that was you know, the, this is the kind of conservatism I was referring to. Mm. Yeah. Would corrupt their minds and turn them into. Yeah. Anyway, that's the kind of South Africa I grew up in. So that gives you some background. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Well. So, uh, uh, what was. What was the other parts of the jobs that you had, you had to do in the army? So you were doing th this. I just published this newspaper. Oh, that was it. Yeah, you got. So I so would you got, go, a, you got a sweet deal. I got a sweet deal. I'll go in in the morning. Um, you know, drive to get up early because we had to be at work early. I lived in Johannesburg, so mm. about an hour's drive to Pretoria each day. We drive there and back each day. Went home on the weekends, so it was really, it, it was a, a really sweet job. Yeah. Yeah, compared to probably many other guys, right? Yeah, when we, we were lucky. I mean, in, in December when it came time for the holidays, uh, we just shut the newspaper uh, and went on holiday. Nobody knew we had gone, you know. <laughs> and I jumped on an army aeroplane so I didn't have to pay for um, tickets to go down to Cape Town to meet my my girlfriend for the holiday. So that was – that was what we did. I just said I'm going down to Cape Town to cover a yacht race. <laughs> so I you, can say these things now. I yeah, yeah, yeah. You, know, you knew the little little the, the little loopholes. You know the little <laughs> loopholes of scams. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah, brilliant. Yeah, we, we, so, <laughs> you know, we we did what we had to do to survive. And know. so was that girlfriend? Um, did she become your wife? Yes, yeah, she did. Yeah, great. Yeah, so yeah. where did you guys originally meet? Um, we met at university. Yeah, okay. Um, I had done. Um, we got introduced through a mutual drama coach. So I had, um, after school, started taking drama lessons. Mm. And um, we were coached by a South African actress. And she had been coaching my wife, Laura, for years. And when I, when I started to go to her, Laura was, in fact, overseas on a gap year. Those days, gap years were, never happened in South Africa. My wife was a very adventurous young lady. And... Um, she went overseas, and um, and while I was in this training, going to to lessons with this lady, she kept mentioning, oh, "I've got a girl I want you to introduce you to. I've got a girl I want you to introduce." You. And um, when 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 Laura came back and started university, um, uh, that we we got we met up that way. Yeah. So. I mean, anytime someone said to me that they want to introduce me to someone, <laughs> it's never been someone that I <laughs> really fancied. So you got lucky. Well, she, I, I, I saw her across the um, like a lecture hall, mm. so I knew what she looked like, and then we arranged to meet um, somewhere on the university campus. And uh, yeah, oh, I liked what I saw when I met her. So <laughs> <laughs> it was it was pretty good. Yeah. 
And so you guys dated for a while, then got married, and you moved to Cape Town, did you say? Yeah, we lived in Johannesburg for a few years, and then we moved to Cape Town. Um, my father-in-law and his brother ran a business in in South Africa, and um, his his brother ran a, the Cape Town office of the business, and he passed away, the brother passed away. So he asked me to go down to Cape Town and, and, and run the Cape Town office of the business. So I left the Johannesburg and... We wanted to get out of Johannesburg anyway, um, and um, we we loved Cape Town. So it's a, one of the most beautiful places on earth. So what a what an opportunity! What uh, at what age was it that uh, apartheid was abol- abolished? That you well, apartheid was officially um, abolished. In, well, let's put it this way: the first free and fair elections in South Africa took place in 1994. Okay, so. Um, in 1990, uh, Nelson Mandela, I'm sure mm. you've heard of him, uh, was released from jail. I was in Cape Town at the time. Um, and um, he was released uh, after 27 years in prison. And 1994 was the first elections that everybody in South Africa could participate in because up to then only whites could participate. In the yeah. And, and I'm assuming you were, you were still living in South Africa at the time? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I voted in those elections. Yeah. yeah. And what was it like? Um, Unbelievable. Was it, was, it? it was absolutely magic at the time. Really? It was – South Africa was just an amazing place at the time. Everything, had, you know, this, the, the tension that it, we'd grown up with it just went away. I mean, there were people that were incredibly fearful and, uh, you know, had boding ill for the future, you know, that everything was going to go to hell in the handbasket and – but it was just, it was euphoric at the time, you know, South Africa was just amazing. And then, um, yeah, then, uh, then South Africa won the Rugby World Cup that <laughs> year, and, um, you know, with those wonderful scenes of, of Nelson Mandela on the pitch and, um, you know, this black president uh, supporting the rugby team and, and hugging the white South African rugby captain. I mean, it was all of a sudden like the, the, the world had changed 180 degrees and South Africa was just this incredible place. It must have brought you a sense of pride. Um, at the time, yeah. absolutely. At, absolutely at the time, yeah. To think that uh, you can go from just this such a negative environment and this um, this toxic racism to then everyone have this groundswell of thinking, you know, enough's enough, we need to change. And, uh, I mean, they, they made a movie about, right, about the, how, how much the, the rugby was just like a… Yeah, Invictus. Uh, a, I mean, it was a phenomenal uh, – it, uh, it was a great movie. But, yeah, it, it did tell the story really, really well about how sport played such a big part in, you know, in Unif- integra- unifying. unifying and integrating South Africa. Yeah, it was, it was amazing at the time. Unfortunately, what's happened to South Africa in the intervening years – through crime and corruption is, is, is awful. I mean, the country is now almost a basket case. Really? Mm. It's, it's uh, nothing works. They, the electricity gets shut off in most places, you know, at least, you know, four to six hours a day because they don't have enough power to go around. Um, unemployment's like pushing 50%. Um, one of the most highest murder rates in the world. Yeah. Um, it's just, you know, we made a decision to leave South Africa because we were worried about what the future may hold, and it, it pains me to say that I was right. But that must have been a hard decision when you when you were thinking about it. It was a very rough, very rough decision because, you know, we had this very sweet life in South Africa. And uh, do you have kids? Yeah, we had. We had, all three kids were born there. Yeah. So I have um, a daughter who's now twenty nine. Mm. And I have twins who are 26, a boy and a girl, uh, all born there. And when we emigrated, they were tiny and we did it alone. We didn't know anyone. We knew one couple here yes. in, in Sydney, one. We knew no one else. Was there any particular uh, event that was a catalyst for you to think we need to, we need to move or was it just uh, you could just see it? Was it was a collection of things. We, could just, we just had a sense that – you know, South, South Africa was unfortunately going to go the same way as, you know, other countries in Africa, as, you know, Zimbabwe next door um, was, was a perfect example. Um, so uh, we just didn't feel like we wanted to bring up our children in this environment. Yeah. 
And so what made you choose Australia? Went around the world and had a look at some other places. Okay. Um, and to be honest with you, um, there were a few things. One, um, the, the, the seasons are correct here. Yeah. So <laughs> same as South Africa, you know. It's summer in December, which is the way it should be when you go on holiday. Um, and you drive on the correct side of the road. You know, in, 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 in America, they drive on the wrong side of the road in Canada. Yeah. Um, the... the what other things? I play the right sports. That was a huge <laughs> right, thing. So I mean, it's rugby and cricket, not ice hockey and basketball. So there were things that were just consistent with your upbringing that you liked. That you sure. Yeah. And there was beaches, <laughs> and there was uh, beautiful sand, and and uh, people spoke English, and uh, the country. Australia is an amazing country, you mm. know, and I've been around the world, and this country works. As much as we like to complain and bitch, this hasn't happened and that doesn't happen, and there, it's all skirting around the edges here. There's no serious politics in Australia. <laughs> Sorry, I don't want to knock this, but there is no serious politics. There's no big issues here. I mean, mm. you can talk around it. There are big issues in terms of existential issues is what I'm talking about. Yeah, there are big issues in terms of housing. Are there big issues in terms of unemployment? Yeah. Are there issues in terms of... Um, cost of living, cost those of, kind of things. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and there is, there is, believe me, there's a lot of racism I see in Australia. Um, so even though it's not institutionalised, sure. but there is. But when you compare these things to what you've seen in other parts of the world or in South Africa, this country it's, works, yeah. and it's a blessing, and I love it, and I'm proud of it. And uh, you know, it's when I came to to Australia, I went, I got tickets to go to the, a rugby match. Uh, it was a centenary match at the newly built Olympic Stadium, Australia playing England. And it was just the most extraordinary experience. There was like almost 100,000 people. It was peaceful. Nobody beat anyone up. <laughs> Everything was organized. We went on this amazing new train. You just hopped on at Bondi Junction and you went out to, to, to Homebush and everything was organized and people didn't, nobody beat each other up or threw fruited each other or beer can over your head or anything like that. It was just absolutely amazing. Yeah. So, um, yeah. I think, yeah, without people having, um, I guess, the the experiences you've had to compare to, um, it is uh, sometimes easy for us to, to bash and, and, and complain about, um, about things where we're actually very lucky. Um, you know, all those things like, yeah, going to – go out to big sporting events in relative safely and, and having public transport that all works and being able to get home and all these kind of things. And then you whinge about the train delay or something like that. You know? Yeah. It, it's, it's just, I have people, you know, we have friends and people and family who come visit from South Africa and they wear their, the ladies wear their handbags across their shoulders and tuck them under their arms, even when they're sitting at coffee shops. Mm. Because that's the way they have to be then. The mindset for Rob, just to prepare yourself you, for a robbery. You're going to get robbed all the time and you yeah. don't drive around with your windows down and you don't stop at traffic lights at night. Yes. If it's yes. intersections clear, you go I've because… Yeah. So, you know, we're in a very… We're, we live in a very blessed place, this. It's, it's just an awesome country. I love it here. I'm very happy I did, made the move. And I support Australia. In everything. Yeah. Okay. So, <laughs> so if it's a sporting yeah. event, Australia versus South Africa, who are you going for? Oh, Australia. Oh. <laughs> I'm an Australian. Yeah. Uh, it says so in my passport. Yeah. You know, I don't have one foot in each country. Okay. Um, you know, in, um, when we're in South Africa, mm. um, I'm Jewish. Yeah. Right. When we're in South Africa and we went to the army, as I previously mentioned, we were, there was racism then. And... In you know in South Africa, the language that that the that the white Afrikaners spoke was called Afrikaans, which is a mix of Dutch and a bit of German and a bit of French and some different language. So they used to call the Jewish people, even in the army, they used to call us Sotpila. So I'll try and translate that um, without being rude okay? <laughs> or saying something I shouldn't. <laughs> Good luck. Uh, okay, um, so. Uh, what w the the reference was that if you stood with one leg in one country, in other words, South Africa, and the other one in the other country, in their reference was Israel, given that we're Jewish, that um, if you were a guy, what was in the middle between your legs would dangle in the sea, and 
hence the term sot, which is salt, that means that what dangled in the sea would become salty. So that's what they would call us. I hope that, without mentioning anything, that, that's, that. so uh, in terms of Australia, no, I don't have one leg in Australia and one leg in South Africa. Both my feet are here. It seems like a very, um, uh, like a very niche or uh, <laughs> it's, a it's a very niche sledge. So, yeah, it's a very creative sledge. Yeah. But uh, yeah, it was uh, a bleak reference. But uh, that's how they kind of. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Um, so so even there's there's racism towards in apartheid Africa not only towards blacks but also against whites to another guy who's white who's Jewish. Sure, I mean I mean on the face of it th th that kind of racism wasn't institutionalized mm. or legislated, um, but it was there. Culture, it was just it, cultural. it was yeah. cultural um, because you know you weren't uh, a white God fearing Christian, which is right. what they wanted you to be. Yeah, and, and even not you couldn't be Catholic wasn't so good either, right? You had to be Calvinist, like Protestant. Yeah, they were better than Catholics. All right, you know, so even know. among the whites, there's still a hierarchy of uh, who who thinks that they're better. Yeah, than the Afrikaners were the best. Yes, it, it doesn't exist anymore. But mm. you know, you know, and if you were kind of had a slightly Aryan appearance, you know, <laughs> if you were blonde and blue eyed, you were idolized. You consider the top of the pecking order. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Like the <laughs> German super race. <laughs> well, I mean, there was there was quite a big neo-Nazi movement mm. in, in in South Africa. These people did idolise that kind of Aryan um, ideology. Mm. What kind of work did you get up to when you when you moved to Australia? I moved to Australia. Um, I started off working um, for a sporting goods company. Mm import of sporting goods and um, that job went very well until I believe actually I came up to uh, the, 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 they appointed a new general manager and he and I clashed and I believe to this day that there was a bit of anti-semitism involved mm. um, in that clash and I left there and then I got involved in various business businesses uh, none of which worked um, uh, which created an incredible amount of stress in our family. And, um, and then um, I got into financial services and uh, became an insurance advisor. And that's what I am to this day. So, yeah, that's what I've done. I'm an insurance advisor. And you enjoy it? <sighs> you know what, Andrew, for a long time, no. Mm. Um, it wasn't what I wanted to be. Um, I had a more creative streak in me and I wanted to you know, do something more creative but the financial services is, is not really creative. Sure. Yeah. And I mean, when you talk about that newspaper in the army, I mean, that sounded like it was quite a creative outlet. We were writing, we were publishing, I was type, I mean, there were a lot of us, I did everything, mm. you know, took pictures, wrote, that, typeset the whole thing. I had to learn to typeset. I imagine that would have been quite stimulating, there was, right? Yeah. And there was no, you know, computers yeah. in, when we were talking those days, it was, everything was manual, typewriters. Yeah. So, so you're doing this job, but it's um, essentially mainly to, for, for a paycheck, for a job mm. rather than mm. something that was really stimulating you. Mm. Um, and um, so I know from um, when you're involved with st Stories at Stir, which mm. was your, the, um, where I kind of mm. got a lead on you, that you'd obviously had this kind of crisis point at some point in your life. Is that, is that it happened around this stage when you're working in financial <laughs> service? No, we, we have to go back okay. uh, a long time. Okay. Um, so maybe I'll just st start telling the story. Uh, I know we've like, got some background on me yes. now, but um, start telling the story and then, and then you know, you can interrupt and sure. ask me questions. Or Go ahead. Um, so when I, I was here in South Africa, uh, sorry, here in Australia and, 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 and working and um, I got to a stage in my life um, when I was about 50 years old and – we had struggled financially for 23 years mm. here in Australia. Twin, I've been here 24 years. We had struggled the whole time financially. It, it was never smooth. My wife worked uh, um, full time um, and we, we struggled to make ends meet. Um, and that, and, and I looked at my, got to that age and, and I suppose I had the quintessential midlife crisis. Mm. Um, and I, I looked around uh, uh, my friends and I saw them 
mm, happier than me. So, and this is my perception, of course. Happier, more successful, more advanced in their careers, wealthier. Um, and I looked at myself and I saw myself as, as a failure. Um, that I hadn't succeeded, um, that I hadn't, that I was not stable, that I hadn't provided well enough for my family. Um, but so I went out and uh, I got a tattoo. Uh, now, for <laughs> and, and now it doesn't uh, it doesn't sound strange, but in our community, uh, especially if you're Jewish, tattoos are frowned upon. You're not supposed to do it. Okay. But I was rebelling, right? So I went out and got a, a tattoo on my shoulder. It happened to be my wife's name. Mm-hmm. Um, so she accepted that, but it, it, she had never wanted a tattoo. And here I'd gone, I was rebelling against everything. Um, did that did that shock her that you got a tattoo? Yeah, it did. After I mean, yeah, it's one thing to get one when you're younger, but when you've got to a certain age, they then suddenly get one. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, the, the people couldn't believe it when mm. they finally saw that I had to tattoo. I went to a 50th birthday party, and it, it was the theme was it was a dress up theme, it dressed up as. Um, uh, as saints or sinners, right? So I went dressed as a barkie and I had jeans and chains and a sleeveless denim jacket and, you know, the whole kind of hell's angel barkie look that I had going and I had a tattoo on. I had my tattoo, right? Yep. So you must, you, you must be thinking this is my tattoo reveal, right? This, thinking, this is exactly yeah. what it was. And other people had come to the party dressed similarly, but they had fake tattoos on. <laughs> so somebody <laughs> looked at my tattoo on my shoulder and said, is how do you get a fake tattoo of your wife's name? And I looked at him, this is a friend of mine's wife. And I said, it's not fake. And she said, oh, nonsense, man, it's fake. I said, it's not fake. It's a real tattoo. Yeah. This was about six weeks after I got it the first time. It seen me without a shirt on. So she actually couldn't believe it. Mm. So she spat on me. She spat on my arm <laughs> and tried to rub, rub it, it off. off. Yeah, yeah, thinking that it was it was a fake to do. When it didn't come off, it was oh my god, oh my god! Look what Craig's done. You know, it was. It's funny, like just a tattoo of your wife's name was so scandalous. <laughs> Absolutely, and it was completely scandalous at the time. Yeah, it's also you know, Eastern suburbs of Sydney, uh, small conservative world. You know, mm. but uh, I mean, the did, rest of Sydney. Did that yeah. feel good to uh, you, you? You'd chosen to do this thing as kind of a rebellious act. Mm-hmm. It sounded like you just wanted some excitement in your life, and this was an outlet for that. Um, I mean, I, I, if I was suddenly people that I knew that were like, oh my God, I'd be like, that was kind of the reaction I was hoping for. Was sure. It? Yeah. Yeah. That was it. <laughs> I was happy to be a bit sensationist and break out of the mold mm. and, and, um, and do something different. Um, but it was all s- symptomatic of a more, a bigger issue. Yeah. Um, that was, uh, it was, you know, bubbling deep inside me. Um, and w- w- I think even though that was symptomatic, in in, in the year or two that followed that, um, my mental state began to deteriorate. Um, I was becoming depressed. Mm. Uh, I was drinking more. I I wasn't drinking like an alcoholic, but I would come home every night and at least have one or two whiskeys Mm -hmm. um, just to take the edge off. Um, I don't think I was a... A great dad at the time. I was, for for many of years, I'd been very bad tempered. So um, I was completely unstable. There were times when I would be the sweetest, nicest, kindest guy, and there was other times where my temper would flare at a moment's notice. Mm-hmm. Uh, road rage, screaming at the kids, um, just quite erratic. Yeah, quite erratic. It was just I was all over the place for for a long time. Was it just smoking? I mean, just drinking? Were you smoking, doing no, any drugs or anything no, like that? No, no smoking, no drugs. I didn't do any of that stuff. But it was just, you know, taking the edge off every night with a few whiskeys. Mm. Um, I wasn't exercising properly. You know, I was put on weight. All sorts of things had gone sideways. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> here's the, here's Good the callback. Term. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it must, it's quite an exhausting feeling when, when you can snap that quickly. You know that you're carrying a lot of tension, right? Um, well, so to use your term, the snap. So one, one Saturday morning, I was at home. I was incredibly low. I was feeling terrible. And I just, Landed up, I was on our spare bed, literally 
my wife was, you know, there was tension between us and I literally broke down on the bed that morning, curled up in the fetal position, sobbing my eyes out. And I told my wife for the first time something that I'd never told a soul Mm. um, since I was 12 years old. Um, So when I was 12 years old, I was raped. And I had never told a single soul since the day it happened. Mm. So we're talking 40 years, over 40 years. You just carried that on your own. I kept it quiet. Um, So when I grew up uh, as as a young boy, I was pretty much a loner. I was, I wasn't kind of bullied so much as I was ostracized. I was like cut out of the group. Um, I wasn't a a fighter. I wasn't into ball sports. I was a swimmer. Um, And I was a kind of a gentle, creative guy. Mm -hmm. And I didn't fit in, you know, with rugby and cricket and soccer and, you know, pooning around, even as a, even as a, you know, in my early years, five, six, seven years old, from the moment I went to what we called kindy here, you know, at four, three or four years old, I felt myself ostracized. I was left out. And that went right throughout my school career. And it embedded in me an incredible sense of uh, insecurity, uh, failure, um, fear of establishing those kind of relationships. Mm. Um, and I just spent a lot of time by myself. But what I also learned to do was to pretend. So I created a separate persona. So there was this happy Craig. And to my parents and to the world, um, I was this happy kid. You know, everything was all sweet. And I was really good at it. Mm. Um, I, I was a, I was a I, if, you, if you want to use a derogatory, I was a really good liar, but I was a really good actor. And yeah. I could pretend. You just put, on, you put on this mask. I just put on this mask and I was just happy. And all the pain that I had in my life, all the rejection, everything was just, I would store it as I've described to people. I would put it like in a vault. So in my hand, there was this imaginary vault with an iron door, a steel door, and I could close it and keep it there and suppress it. And that's where it stayed. And when this happened to me at 12 years old, I was... I was, uh, on, on Saturdays, I had no one to play with as a kid, right? So I would go near my house. There was a sporting club and there was people used to go play tennis and play lawn bowls and, and that kind of thing. And I'd ride my bike down the sporting club and I would just lie on the grass watching people play tennis um, or even watching people play lawn bowls. And one day uh, I was lying there, as I said, 12 years old, um, a man came up to me. He lay down next to me on this kind of the grass embankment, started to chat to me, and I chatted to him. I was incredibly innocent. There was no education on don't talk to strangers at those days. Yeah. And he was chatting to me, and uh, he, after about half an hour, it was kind of hot in the sun. It was December in Johannesburg. He said, would you like a Coca-Cola? Now, Coca-Cola was a special thing in those. Those was a treat. Right? Mm. We didn't keep Coke in the house and we just certainly didn't buy Coca-Cola. And if you so wanted a young one, kid, was, that's quite an exciting offer. It was an exciting offer. The guy said, would you like a Coca-Cola? Mm. And this was great. I didn't even have to pay for it, right? He was going to mm. give me one. So he said, come. And we went into the clubhouse and he said, come, the Cokes are here. And he took me to a back room. And without going into too much graphic detail, in that back room, he raped me. Mm. Um, and... Afterwards, I went home. Um, I went to the bathroom. I cleaned myself up. Um, I threw away my underwear and I opened that steel vault and I put the experience in there and I closed it and I never told anyone. But that experience at that age, you know, prepubescent before you've really found yourself as a, you know, as a, as a, as a young man or anything like that, this experience kind of 
as I've described it to other people, it kind of rubber stamped all the insecurities, all the feelings that I had about being worthless mm. and rejected. Here I was used and tossed away um, by, by someone and it, it becomes embedded in your mind that this is what you're worth. So <laughs> looking back on it and, all, and through lots of therapy, um, it, it, be, it became the formative experience of my, of my life and the way I reacted to everything from then on. I always felt I wasn't good enough. Uh, I would self-sabotage myself as a result, whether it was in, uh, in careers, in everything you know, like that. And if I, if I hadn't found my wife at the time I found her, um, then I think I was on a slippery slope to, to oblivion because she rescued me at that time. Mm. She found me and she, she obviously she didn't know, but here was somebody who suddenly loved me. She loved me for no other reason than being me. She didn't ask anything of me except to love her back. And that saved me at that stage. I was at university. I was lost. I didn't know where I was going to go or what I was going to do. And here was this woman who suddenly gave me love and direction and a sense of purpose in life. And so I devoted myself to her. Um, but jump forward 30 years, 40 years, after the enormous stress that immigration brings, uh, finding your feet and the financial pressures that we were being in, it suddenly, with this midlife crisis, it all came bursting out. Mm. And it, it, it changed, obviously changed everything for us and, and, and in our family. Um, my children uh, at that stage were, you know, late teens, early 20s. Um, I'm lucky that I have three very intelligent and emotionally mature children uh, who have given me incredible support. But after that, obviously, I went into therapy. Yeah, what was that yeah. conversation like when you told your wife? I mean, it was the first person you'd ever told about this. Um, it must have been an incredibly hard conversation for you. Um, it, it was, you know, I, I'm, not a, I'm not a woman and I've never given birth to a child. Mm -hmm. But I can only imagine, the only thing I can relate it to is that how I imagine that pain to feel the pain of childbirth was how it actually felt to me saying those words for the first time, because I'd never said them aloud to myself, mm. never mind to anyone else. Just to say I was raped was so traumatic mm. that I was sobbing uncontrollably. It was like I couldn't stop. I couldn't stop crying. It was just phenomenal and shaking. It was just incredibly painful. And it's so unfair like that on top of all this, when you were 12, you'd already trained yourself to put on this mask, you know, to just be the happy boy just because you didn't want to burden your other loved ones with what was really going on behind the scenes. And then that the, the, this hugely traumatic event, you just slide in under that to being, oh, business as usual, I've just got to continue to be happy Craig and, and feel like, well, it was bad enough to talk about how unhappy I am generally, let alone having this horrific event happen to me. Um, this is nothing, not, not something that, um, you know, any child should have to go through. What a horrible, I mean, it's, I think the, and, and, and this is important that, that there are, I don't like to use the term, um, uh, uh, uh child abuse because I, I like to get a bit more specific so that people understand because child abuse can be a little bit clinical. And it can be a little bit, well, almost like what the newspapers would say because they don't want to go into too much detail. Um, but it's, you know, the child sexual assault um, is so abhorrent mm. because the, the person you're assaulting is defenseless. Yeah. Not only... Uh, physically defenseless, but they're emotionally defenseless. They don't know, you don't know how to deal with this. Mm. There's no way to process it. And, and even with adult rape, there, there, there's, 
trying to process this is or what's happened to you is so difficult um, as an adult. You can only imagine as a child. Um, it's just unfathomable. And, and this is, you know, you, you have no idea of sexualization. I mean, we had no idea of what, that I had no idea at age 12 that a man could actually have intercourse with a man. Mm. Uh, it wasn't something that even entered my head. We're going back to this really conservative South Africa. We didn't even know it. Yeah. It didn't even come into my head that this was even a possibility, uh, let alone how it could be physically possible. Yeah. So saying it for the first time was, in a way it opened up everything and, and allowed me to, to, to go on, to start a path towards some kind of healing. But um, it, it, was, it, it was an incredibly difficult thing to do at the time. At what point after you saying it for the first time did it begin to, to feel cathartic? Did, did, it, did at some point did it feel better to have got got shared that burden with someone else? Yeah, it certainly felt better to have spoken up. Absolutely, mm. uh, I, and I wish I had done it decades before. Mm. But if you if you read a lot of the literature, and I've been in support groups with uh, with other guys who've been raped, you. People just don't. The guys lock it up. It's it's they just don't talk about it, and and there's a really there's a few reasons for that. Uh, shame. Mm -hmm. There's an incredible amount of shame. Yeah, that's put it. Guilt. Yeah, and guilt. I'll I'll explain guilt. You sometimes feel that you're somehow responsible for this, that you brought it upon yourself, so you feel incredibly guilty, or that you might have shamed your family. Mm. Or disappointed someone. That's such a fucked up feeling to feel guilt over something like that. But yeah, but guys do. Yeah, people do. Yeah, people do. I'm not saying it's only guys, but obviously my experiences of guys and the, the groups that I've been in is with guys. So mm. yeah, you get this incredible guilt. What did I do to bring this on? Mm. I, and then the other thing is, did I deserve this? Mm. Uh, did I deserve it? Is this is who I am. I, am I responsible for it somehow? Did I bring it upon myself? So there's all those feelings that come out so you choose not to speak up because you don't want the ramifications you know have i embarrassed my family um how will we deal with it you know what's the point it's just going to be harder for me to talk about it yeah especially in that conservative south africa that i spoke about earlier it was even more difficult it was even more taboo yeah you know yeah yeah, yeah i'd think yeah if i if i open this can of worms who knows where this where this path goes mm. once i Give it a name. Yeah. Once am I, I am I out. tainted goods? Mm. You know, am I forever marked by this? Mm. So it's it, you know. But thankfully here. Sorry, did you? What no, no. Go ahead. So thankfully here, uh, you know, um, my wife is a counselor, and um, I went into therapy, and we went into therapy as a couple, and how are we going to m do this mark this forward, but. I suppose this is a, a lesson for a lot of people who might listen to this this podcast and, 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 and want to take things from it. The first therapist I went to didn't help, <laughs> I suppose is the way to put it. Um, her approach was to get me to talk about my past and my history. And obviously in 90 minutes, I can't go into other aspects of, you know, my upbringing and that. But I spoke about it a lot. So every time I would go into a session with her, it was about opening this wound. But she never taught me the skills uh, to deal with what I was coming out with. So I would leave those sessions having poured everything out and ripped open these wounds, but left raw and yeah. undressed. And no way to deal with them. And, and so I was there and talking, think, well, I'm doing the right thing. This is what therapy is, you know, get, talk about these things in some way. It's going to heal me. But I didn't have, shouldn't, I didn't learn any lessons. I wasn't taught anything. Like, how do you manage this? How do you change your thinking? Well, so I just felt like I was just poking an open wound and there was. Every time I went, yeah. it's poking an open wound. And the rest of my life wasn't improving right. as a result. <laughs> so I, I, my attitude wasn't improving. I was still not happy. 
uh, the, the circumstances around me weren't changing. Life was still difficult. Finances were still a pressure. Right. So people, I mean, there could be an assumption that you, you start therapy, that's, you know, it's, this is going to solve the problem. Yeah, I think <laughs> it's a magic wand. You know, you go and speak to someone and you sit down and you say, this is what happened to me. And you pour your heart out. And I'm not mocking or knocking, but finding the right fit and the right therapist is really, really important. It's like, it's like, any way I can relate it to is like, you know, if you've got an infection, you, you have to find the right antibiotic, right? Some antibiotics fight some you know, infections and some fight others. It's the same kind of thing. And everybody's different and you have to find a therapist that works for you. Yep. And in my case, I, had, I needed to find somebody who was more intellectual and who, who challenged me and not just, you know, speak, but also taught me lessons mm. on how do you deal with your thoughts? How do you deal with the feelings that you're getting? Because you get feelings, which is normal, and you have thoughts, which is normal, and then you you t you, you you act as a as a result of those feelings, thoughts, and actions. But you have to change the way you think. Did you ever was there ever a consideration on whether the therapist that you would go to was a man or a woman? I. I would wonder, like, uh, if I'm talking about something as sensitive as, as rape, um, whether that would be uh, – I, I wouldn't know whether I would feel more comfortable with a man or a woman. It didn't really make a difference to yeah. me. Mm -hmm. um, I actually felt – I felt very comfortable talking to a woman. And the, the, the therapist that I eventually found that helped me was a woman again. Mm. Um, but, yeah, so what happened was that after, I don't know, 18 months of therapy – I wasn't getting any better just over a year of therapy. And, and my mental state was actually becoming worse. And I started to have... What did that look like when your mental state was getting worse? What, 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 well, what? I started to have ideations of suicide. Okay. So I, I started to think about, about taking my life. Um, I actually wrote one day a, a long, for what, want of a better term, was a suicide note which I actually read to my psychologist at the time, uh, or the therapist at, at the time, over the phone. And in it, I didn't actually say I was going to take my life. It was, to use a, a modern term, I was going to virtually take my life. And the, the way I thought of it was I told her, I, I have to get away. I have to get away from the pain. I have to get away from the responsibility. I have to get away from this. My family probably see me as a burden because I'm so erratic um, and I'm useless to everybody. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to disappear. I will go to find a town somewhere in Western Australia and get a job uh, packing shelves in a, in a pub or, or whatever and find a little – place or a caravan and, and disappear off the face of the earth. That was kind of the virtual suicide. And that was the early days of trying to escape this world that I was living in. Um, How did the therapist respond to, to you talking through that? No, she tried to she tried, oh, she tried to talk me out of it yeah. and, and, and uh, don't, and don't be so rash and come talk to me and we'll deal with it. And, and she kind of talked me out of it, but I was, it's you know, you started to get in these incredibly heightened emotional states where um, your thinking becomes completely out of whack. Yeah. You, you, you're completely blurred. You don't – thinking processes no longer follow the paths that they should follow. And it's – so those were the, the early days and, and, and things weren't improving. And then – it was about in my, I had a, I had my own business. It's important to understand. I had my own little, eventually had my own little insurance practice. Mm -hmm. And I got to the point where it, 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 I don't know if people know, but you know, there was the uh, Royal Commission into financial services and there was a whole lot of additional um, legal restrictions that were put on everybody. And it made actually earning a living as a one man show really, really difficult. And I eventually decided to sell my practice. And I sold it. Uh, I was in the process of selling it 
to another company and I was going to go and work for that company after selling my book of business to them. Mm. And I got very sick. They didn't know what was wrong with me. What were the symptoms? Um, I was exhausted. Mm. Um, I was losing weight. Mm. Um, I was um, I had he headaches, um, body aches, um, and I went into hospital. They did all sorts of investigations, scans, everything, and you know it was terrible because we thought the worst. We thought I had some cancer, cancer or yeah. some awfully awful disease. Uh, eventually, they found out that I had liver disease, um, which was curable. But the the f the fact that I had um, the fact that I had got that this disease had come at that time when I was just about to sell the business. And then there was another big issue hanging over me that I had got myself into a lot of debt that my wife didn't know about. Hmm. And the moment the business sold, she was going to find out about it because instead of this chunk of money coming to us, I'm just going to pay off to sell the business, I first had to pay off all these debts. Hmm. And I had hid this from her. And I, I, you know, we had, I, I'd wanted to give my children everything that I possibly could. My eldest daughter went overseas to study medicine. That was a huge impasse. We took out extra mortgage to pay for that. Um, and, I, and just to live, I had borrowed money uh, against the value of my business. Hmm. And... I knew this moment was coming where I was going to have to tell her the truth. And then this illness came upon me. And it literally took from me every last bit of strength that I had. The worry, the stress of it, um, and this impending sale, it, it wiped out any bit of mental and psychological resource that I had left to keep going. So you're just, you're on empty. I was on empty. Mm. And then one day, um, it was COVID now. So working from home, incredibly stressful. Life was stressful for everyone in the whole world. But, and, the, and that on top of what was going on in my own personal <coughs> life just brought a whole other dimension, you know, lockdowns and that kind of thing. And I was just one afternoon and I just cracked. I said to myself, I can't handle this anymore. I found that letter, that, that kind of pseudo suicide note that I'd written. I made some very quick alterations to it. It was not really a suicide note. It was more just how I felt about myself and life in general. I made some quick assaults to it. I printed it out at home. I put it on my wife's bed, on our bed, with my wedding ring. I got into my car and I drove. And I had thought about this in the past. I had done some research about how to take my life. Um, and I decided to put the plan into action. I had medication that I had accumulated over time. I'm not going to say what I used because I don't like to promote those things. Mm -hmm. um, but I had accumulated this medication and I had made a decision that um, if I was going to die, I wanted to go die at my favorite spot in Sydney. So I love the city and I love its views and I had found a spot in Sydney that was magnificent. And I, any visitor who came to Sydney, I would take them there said, you have to see Sydney from here. And I left the note and I drove in my car. And it was about an hour from where I lived in the traffic. Not an hour by normal distance, but because of traffic, it was 3.30, 4 o'clock in the afternoon. The phone started to ring, my mobile phone. Could you, see who, was, could you see who was calling? daughter was calling, my mm. son was calling, my wife was calling, my sister was calling, my parents, because they got home and they they found the note. Of course. Uh, where is he? Oh, my God, where is and he? And the ring. And the ring. Mm. And I sent them a text that said, don't try and find me. Just leave me. 
And I didn't answer those calls and I didn't answer those texts and I drove to my destination and I parked looking at that view and in five minutes I swallowed, I don't know, 50, 60, 70 tablets, Mm -hmm. washed it down with half a bottle of scotch in five minutes. Um, Sent out a final text to my family, and was that's a the goodbye, last a goodbye text. Goodbye text, and that was the last thing I remember. Do you remember anything more about just your the last few thoughts you had when you're sitting there swallowing all these pills? You know, it's that's a very incisive question, and and it's something that I I've given a few talks about this in the past, and it's something that I touch on. And it seems to have helped a lot of people when I speak about this particular issue. When you make a decision or when I made a decision to take my life and I've read about this with other people, you you get what's technically called cognitive dissonance. So without being technical, it's essentially, it's like looking down a tunnel. So normally in life, if you have issues that you have to face, you, um, search for your, in your mind searches for three or four different options. You know, what could I do? I could do this. I could do that. I could do when you have cognitive dissonance. It's like tunnel vision. It's like looking down a straw and all you see at the end is this one dot. And that's the only option available to you. So I had convinced myself, well, this was in, in, in totally rational thinking, as far as I saw it, that I was a failure, that I'd be better off dead that all the pain that I'd felt inside me for all these years, the ostracization, the, the rape, the feeling useless, the failure would be gone. I wouldn't have to suffer this anymore. And my family wouldn't have to deal with me. They were better off without me. And I was 100% convinced that what I was doing was the right thing. You know, a lot of people turn around and say, well, people who commit suicide are cowards or they've taken the easy way out or um, they were insane at the time that they did it. None of this is true Mm. for me. Um, I was thinking, as far as I was thinking, I knew 100% rationally. This is how I saw it. And you'd built a perspective in which this was not selfish at all. This was actually, this was the the right right move. Yeah, Correct. They didn't have to deal with me anymore. They didn't have to deal with my moods and my problems and all of the things. I I was better off dead because the pain would be gone and they would be better off without me because they wouldn't have to deal with me anymore. Right. So, I mean, if that's what you're saying, then I would imagine when you swallowed these pills and had this whiskey that instead of um, having panic, I'd feel a, a, a relative level of peace wash over me. That this totally at peace. Mm. Totally at peace. I, I was at, it wasn't like I was manic or anything like that. I was so focused. Uh, it was like a laser focus. I was so focused as I drove. I knew exactly where I was going. I didn't break the speed limit. I even thought to myself, don't break the speed limit. Always need to get you. The last thing you want is for a cop to pull you over. Yeah. It was like I I did everything completely rationally. Went there, found the parking space, made sure I didn't park near anyone else so that they could wouldn't find me. This is someone who's trying to effectively have a suicide where <laughs> you don't want to make any mistakes that are going to get in the way of Correct. you going through with the plan. Correct. It was it – was, other than the fact that the note was hastily corrected and wasn't the most thought out suicide note, mm. it was, it was, it was planned. It was rational. It was, it was hundred percent clear thinking as far as I could see. Yes. Um, so everything else that I can tell you afterwards, uh, is reported by other, other people. people. Yeah, of course, because you blacked out. Right? I was gone. So within five minutes I was out. Yep. It, it didn't even take that long. Mm. Five minutes, I was out in the car. I had closed the windows and I would locked the doors mm. so that they couldn't be easily rescued, right? Um, however, that last text that I sent out that I mentioned, mm. I had written, don't try and fire me. This is the best for all of us. Along these lines, mm. I'm going to die looking at my beautiful Sydney. Now, I meant to type the word view, but it came out because I was not, my eyes were going, my head was going. It came out as the word Jim, G-Y-M. So when my family got that mm. and the police were at my house and they're thinking, 
trying to figure out where could he have gone, they they thought my sister actually said, doesn't make sense in beautiful Sydney gym. That's a that's a typo. Hmm. And my daughter, my younger daughter, said, you know, he probably means view because and I know where it is. She said, I'm, if it's if it means if it's my beautiful Sydney view, I know where he is. I know where he's gone. Hmm. And she told this to the police. This is my daughter. So the police phoned the other uh, uh, um, uh, command closer to where I was yep. and said, we've got a report. This is his car. This is the rego. This is where we think has gone. Just go and patrol. Go and see if he's there. And they found me. And the policeman, two cops, smashed open the window of the car, got me out called the ambulance, uh, ambulance came, took me to hospital. Um, this is all I'm just reporting. Yes. Phoned my family, told them where I was. I was in emergency. Uh, I was intubated, um, which means that they had to put tube down my throat because I was stopping to breathe. 15 minutes, the doctors told me 15 minutes. If it was 15 minutes later, Longer. I was gone. Mm. My breathing was stopping, becoming so shallow. So, <laughs> unfortunately, your family know you too well enough, right? That you that you fucked up your own plan by giving them too much information. <laughs> um, so. You know, uh, maybe you know, looking back on it, and I thought about this before. Maybe looking back on it, it was it was somehow subconscious. Maybe mm. there was something, part but of I it. hadn't even typed it correctly because yeah. I was so going off already mm. and losing it that um, it came out as a strange word, and it mm. took the Powers of deduction and my family knowing me, you know, but translate that this was, was wrong. Maybe, yeah, that there was some subconscious part of you that was like, we've still got to, we've, we've got to have a gamble here. There's got to be, we've got to give them half a shot, a one in a hundred chance that <laughs> they'll still be able to find me because. Yeah, I mean, I, I look, uh, and I'm lucky I did. And I, I spent yeah. a few days in hospital there while I recovered. So 15 minutes, that was, that's the time difference between you being here right now and being dead. 15 minutes. Fuck. So, so I stayed intubated for about 24 hours until mm. I could breathe by myself again. Mm. Um, this happened on a Thursday night. So sorry, Thursday how, long, how long ago was this that this happened? 2020. Okay, right. Yeah, September 2020. Mm. So it was a Thursday night that I did it, Thursday late afternoon. And I don't remember anything clearly until Sunday morning. Because that's how long it took for the drugs to get out of my system to the point that I could actually cognitively understand what was around me. Mm. Um, yeah, it took me 24 hours before they took the tubes out so that I could start breathing on my own again. So it was, it was touch and go. It was really borderline stuff. And... After that, I got through my wife's hard work um, and making a million phone calls. She got me into a clinic. What are those? What's the first conversation like with your wife when you've come out of this? When I, when I woke up hmm. in the hospital and I looked over, I saw my wife and my daughter sitting next to me. And I just looked at my wife and I said, just said hi, baby. Hmm. And I've I said this. I've, it took me a long time to try and understand what happened afterwards. I was from that moment so ecstatic to be alive. I had gone from this sheer despair and this um, incredible willingness to die to suddenly waking up and being happy that I was alive. And, I, you know, I've tried to understand how I transitioned from that over those three days of being conscious or semi-conscious, unconscious, into you know, wanting to be alive. And I think it's because I had seen something in myself that... That I, that 
I had, I had reached that such a low point that I could do what I did mm. that kind of the only way was up <laughs> kind yeah. of story. I mean, it, 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 it sounds really almost sounds like chocolate boxy, but it was. It mm. was it's the only way. We've, we've hit as low as we could possibly ever get. I mean, yeah, the story was uh, literally. Go? Just build from here. The story you know? was literally, I mean, as close to the end as you can get, basically, 15 yeah. minutes between story ending and story continuing. Uh, and so what, that gave you a level of <laughs> some re- uh, optimism. I suppose so, yeah. yeah. Well, suddenly it was for you, well, the, the only way is up. If I've survived this, the, the, I was probably meant to. Mm. Yeah. And and part of you know, the talks I do in doing this podcast is that reason, is that I now want to share my story to for a couple of reasons. One, to explain to people what went on in my head mm. so they can understand the thinking of people yep. who – are planning to take their lives and at that time also or that have succeeded in taking their lives because one of the things that is is the real victims of suicide are the people left behind yes so they're the ones who suffer and one of the big things they suffer on was you know they don't understand cannot fathom what was going on in their loved one's head at the time so what i explained to you about my thinking earlier is actually people have come up to me and said that's probably the most helpful thing you've said because it's just given us some peace of mind that this is how my son or my husband or my father was thinking yep. at the time um, that he thought he was doing the right thing. Because you get robbed of that conversation. There's so many questions there that never yeah. get answers, yeah. right? And so you're the closest thing to that because, yeah, I, I've uh, lost um, a close friend to suicide and, you, yeah, you, you wonder all those questions about what, what could have been the mental state that got them to that point that thought there was no way out. Why did he do it? Mm. Why didn't he talk to us? Mm. Didn't, didn't he love us? Mm. That he thought he would leave us? Why was he so, so selfish and cruel to leave mm. us behind like this? Leave me to raise my children. Leave me to nurse my mother. You know all these kind of questions. Yeah. Um, and but just trying to explain how I was thinking at the time and how my mind was working as somebody who survived, um, but did all of that. That is one thing that I can do to help the the, the victims of suicide. Yes. Um, the other thing is that you know I'm. This happened to me as a midlife crisis, mm. as a uh, an adult male who is supposed to be, um, you know, successful and um, fit and healthy and whatever the case may be, and all these um, idealized things that are placed upon us and these pressures. I want people like me to get up and talk, just to go and talk to someone, because the help's out there. Mm. Just do it, because. You can, in talking to people, you can save someone's life. And also to people where you see somebody struggling or you see something that's wrong, you know, go up to them and talk to them. And if you say to them, are you okay? And they say, and I'm, please, I'm not knocking that campaign at all. But if you go up and you say, are you okay? And they say, most of the time, people are going to turn around and say, I'm fine. Yeah, I'm alright. I mean, how many of us, like yourself, are wearing masks? You don't want to burden I'm someone. I'm cool. Yeah, so you push further. Mm. Say, I don't think you are. Yeah, you don't look right to me. You don't look okay to me. Mm. You're not reacting. You're not behaving okay to me. Something's wrong. Talk to me. And if you push a little bit harder, there's a greater chance that you'll get somebody to open up. Yeah, we don't absolve. Sorry, I'm not interrupting, but you don't absolve yourself mm. of that responsibility just because. You say to me, Andrew, you just come to me, Craig, Craig, are you okay? And I say, yes, I'm okay. Andrew thinks, well, you know, it's all good. I did, I did the right thing. I asked. Do you think, yeah, I mean, it, it seems like um, it's almost like if, if you say to someone, it's skin deep, it's just very skin deep to say, are you okay? Um, and then if they say, yeah, they're fine, you think, tick, job done. Yeah. But, um, and you're you, absolved of some kind of responsibility and you've done the right thing. But you can actually ask a few more probing questions. Absolutely. And I think, uh, I think you're right. I've had an experience with that before where I've actually asked a few more probing questions because I didn't think that the, right, that the answer that I got 
at face value was accurate. Mm. And then you find, I think if someone realizes that you're, you're not asked, just asking a question just um, to ask it, but because mm. you've noticed something that you're, you're more likely to get a genuine answer. Absolutely. And so those are the, those are the goals that I'm trying to achieve by just doing this. Those three goals, okay. helping people understand the minds of their loved ones at the time they try to take their lives or take their lives. Mm. Um, Help getting guys like me, obviously because I'm, you know, male and middle aged. But anybody, you know, if you've got any issues, just talk up, just ask for help. It's there. Um, you, you don't have to do this alone and on your own. It's so. This happened in September 2020. You said so. I mean, it's what been almost three years. Yeah. I mean, it's not. That's still not that long a time um, since since the suicide attempt. Mm. These, all these initiatives of helping others and raising awareness are fantastic, but I, I, what, what have you done? What are you doing for yourself? Well, I haven't, didn't just start doing this straight away. Yeah. I, I, I had to fix myself first. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So post the, the suicide attempt, um, I went into a clinic. Yep. Uh, I went into a psychiatric clinic and I spent about two and a half weeks there. But the amazing thing was that, Literally on the day of admission, <clears throat> got interviewed by a medical doctor and then uh, a, a junior psychiatrist, psychologist, and then the senior psychiatrist. And within one day, they diagnosed me as having major depressive disorder. And so this was despite all the um, the the the, the circumstantial things that had gone on in my life, um, including the rape and the ostracization and all this. I had major depressive disorder on top of all of that. And they diagnosed me straight away, irrespective of that. And I started the next day on medication. Um, and it has been an absolute revelation. Really? Revelation. Wow. People say sometimes, look, everybody is different. And this is the part where I don't want to say that taking a pill is going to cure you or fix you. But, and sometimes people need mixes of medication and they change their medications and it's very hard to find the right combinations. I struck it lucky that the first medication they gave me, some of them take two, three months to work. I was feeling better in a matter of days. In a matter of days, my thinking changed. Yes, yeah, so I was going to ask, what does it look? What does it feel like um, when when y you think that the drugs are working? What you f you felt um, better f uh, physically and mentally? What does it look? What Absolutely. does it look like? Yeah, I, you just suddenly feel like. How can I put this? I'm going to be very simple. I suddenly felt happier. <laughs> okay, it, it's it's it's, it's, work. it's weird yeah. to say that, but I just suddenly felt happier. Mm. Where I felt completely sad most of the times. Obviously, this is look the drugs work on chemicals in your brain, right? Yeah. So obviously, something chemically in my brain mm. wasn't working correctly, and the drugs help that. Mm. So immediately, it doesn't deal with the issue, but what it does is it takes the edge off. Right. So what it does is, whereas my moods would vacillate. From total sad to I wasn't I wasn't I don't have a manic depressive disorder, but where where I would be very low and uh, then I could lose my temper and become very angry or along those lines. Now my moods became moderated and narrower band. Mm -hmm. I suppose that's a probably the best way to describe it. It didn't cure me. I hadn't dealt with any of my issues, but what it is, it gave my mind a chance to rest. That I had a much narrower band of emotions to deal with. The lower points weren't so low. And the high points weren't so crazy. I wasn't so angry. I wasn't so upset. I wasn't so, uh, um, um, I was never violent, mm. but, you know, um, in terms of being physically violent, but um, my thinking could have been. Mm. And it just brought this down into a much more manageable brand. So I freed up Space. It's like it's like in a way, it's like you know when you free up space on a computer. Yeah. Suddenly you've got more RAM that you can process <laughs> things with. You know. Um, 
and that's what it was like. It was like suddenly I had more space in my mind to process. You've talked quite a bit about, um, you know, your own view of yourself and your own self-worth. Um, did it did it help you to feel more, uh, have a positive view of yourself? No. It didn't. Okay. That it didn't. That came from therapy. Okay. So um, the psychiatrist that I was under, who I'm still under, I only see him once every six months for a check-in now mm. um, and to get prescription, what I call my happy pill. But um, the, psychi- the psychologist that he put me on to was a phenomenal woman. She was unbelievable. She, ca- she, she got me and she connected with me from day one. And it, it didn't become about pouring my heart out and opening all those wounds. Obviously, I had to and talk about everything, but she gave me the tools to deal with it. She changed the way I thought. So there's all this talk now and a lot of articles written about neuroplasticity, changing the way your mind works. And they can you teach different parts of the brain to learn things they didn't know before. So to te- teach people uh, to write with the other hand or to... Uh, to walk again when they couldn't before, just with brain damage. But neuropist, what you need to do is you need to rewire the thinking in your brain. So think of the brain as a computer that's just gone wrong, right? And some of the wires are crossed and things aren't working right. You have to deconstruct, so you have to unwire the way you were thinking and then rewire to think differently. Sounds like a lot of work. It was, Andrew, it was... A lot of work. The first week was like twice a week for the first few weeks. And then we got on to once a week. But hard work. I like mm. had homework. Mm. And I would I would be exhausted from it. I would get home and, and at the end of a day and I was bushed because I was continually checking in on myself. How am I thinking? Mm. Did my was my thought processes correct? Was my decision making correct? Am I okay? And I kept asking myself these questions. Did I do that right? Did I think right? Did I say the right thing? And did I act correctly? Yeah. And so the, the, it, was such, it was hard, hard work. And this is an important thing. You cannot, if you, have a, if you have a mental illness or a mental illness diagnosis, you can't just expect you're going to take a pill and it's going to fix you. Hmm. Um, and I don't want to preach, but it's hard work. Did to it feel, rewire your brain. But did, I mean, yes, hard work, but did it also feel exciting to be um, going through that process of trying to, to learn um, a bit about your mind and how it worked and then challenge that and try and go in a different direction? Absolutely. I would have found it, that very stimulating. It's, it, it was stimulating. So she, the psychologist actually made it fun for me. Great. In, into some, some extensions. And I learned other techniques. Mm. Like I learned how to, how to meditate. Mm. Um, I learned how to breathe because um, that all affects how your brain's working and slowing down your heart rate. And it doesn't slow down your heart rate. It slows down your brain rate. So how, if you think too quickly, it's like driving too quickly, right? You've got less time to react. So if you slow down the way you're thinking and then give yourself time, you make better decisions. So but learning to do that, is like learning to drive again. Mm. And it's, it, it, it was really, really hard work, but eventually it became second nature. And I became, I changed the way, I think, and it took at least a year of working with her to, to change those things and, and to change the way I thought and doing these exercises and doing this homework. And it wasn't just that hour in a session with her every once a week, it was constant work. And what were the flow on effects of that work in terms of, I guess, your um, professional work and also your, your relationships? Well, my relationship with my wife and children has improved incredibly well, hmm. incredibly. Um, my career is going from strength to strength. I did sell my business um, to that group. They took me back despite what had happened, they, my, my, they have been incredibly supportive. Uh, my employers have been amazing. That's great. Um, which, is, which is really good and it's an example to a lot of employment places in Australia. You know, support your staff for their mental health. It's really, really important. 
um, my productivity is improved. I'm a, I'm a better advisor. I'm a better human being. I'm a better friend. My, my friendships have changed mm. um, so dramatically because now I was able again, despite after 40 years, to open up and to be more available. Mm. And if you want people to come into your world, you have to open the door. So you have to say, I want to be your friend and I want to be here for you. And it's um, – I, would, I never thought I was worthy of their friendship. I thought I was, they were just friends with me because my wife was this wonderful, warm, open person and I was just her husband. Um, but you know, I learned to value myself because I saw that these people valued me. I was amazed post my suicide attempt on how people were the outpouring of love and care. I never thought these people loved and cared for me because I never saw it myself. Yeah. I never valued myself that way. So... I was amazed at how much they valued me. So it sounds like your quality of life is the best it's ever been. Is that right? Yeah. I mean, look, life is not without its challenges. Sure. They don't go away. Sure. And, and when you, the difference is that now when life presents you with a challenge, you, I, I live by this maximum, maximum. There's the things in life that, there's, there's two things in life you should never worry about, okay? All the things, okay, that you can change and all the things you can't. Because why worry about them? If yeah. you can change them, change them. Do something them. about it, yeah. Then you don't have to worry. <laughs> if you can't change them, then it's out of your control, don't so worry don't worry. It. Mm. So it sounds like a platitude, but it does work really well. Because you just think, well, what can I do? And you just got to deal with the way what life presents to you. I don't wake up in the morning thinking, today's going to be the best day in the whole world and I'm pumping the air and everything's fantastic and I'm going to crush, uh, you know, I'm going to do this deal and crush the day. You know? yep. I get up in the morning and I'm prepared for whatever life is going to throw at me. I'm prepared. You've So – You've come back from almost the brink of destruction, right? Um, very lucky to have survived your suicide attempt. And now you've been able to be diagnosed, get medication, get um, the, the treatment that you need to be able to um, be on this much more positive path where the future looks bright. Uh, what, what would you say to people um, that are going – because a lot of the problems you're talking about, um, you know, family stress and financial pressures are, are very common problems. That There are probably a lot of people that have gone through similar things that have thought about suicide. Um, what what? Obviously, you got lucky and survived that and have gone on this positive path. But what, what advice would you have to people before they get to that point where they, you know, risk losing their life through suicide? You know, when earlier I spoke about that tunnel, mm. that there's this, all you see is this one option that you have. Yeah. I, I just want to let people know that there is another light at the end of that tunnel. And it's warm and it's bright and it's beautiful. You just have to reach out for it. You just have to walk towards that light. Don't disappear down that black hole. And the way you do it is to talk about your problems. Reach out. There are so many organizations in Australia now. It's so much at the forefront. There's Lifeline. There's Beyond Blue. There's the Black Dog Institute. There's, there's so many organizations that you can reach out for initial help. Go talk to your GP. GPs these days are, are skilled at discussing these things and can point you in the right direction. There's mental health plans that you can go on. And... There's the public hospital system in Australia is fantastic. So reach out for help, okay? Grasp it and go for it because whatever you have is not incurable. Whatever you have is not insurmountable. Um, that can be dealt with. And there are people out in this world who love and care for everyone and will give you love and care. And you just have to go and reach out and find it. And don't be scared to speak up and seek help. If you had, if you had a disease, you would go to the doctor, physical disease. If you had cancer, you would go to the hospital. 
mental health is exactly the same. You can be fixed. You can get help. You can find ways to continue living happy, productive, um, meaningful life and, and, find, and find your path. You know, I, I, I don't want to sound like a preacher, but I'm talking from lived experience. Yeah. Um, look, there's one other thing. I was very lucky that I had and have the wife and family that I have. My wife and children were incredibly and still are incredibly supportive, uh, incredibly loving, incredibly tolerant and accepting of everything. And they have been the bedrock on which I've built my healthy life. Not everybody has that. Hmm. And I, I have to say, a lot of people in this world are very alone. Yeah. And that is terrible. And that's very difficult. But this doesn't mean that there aren't organizations and there aren't individuals out there whose life's mission is to help people. Um, and if you just reach out and go look for it, you'll find it. You will find it. You know, I think it was in 2021, 3,144 people took their lives in Australia. Mm. About, I think it was just under 70% of them were men. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's an absolute, it's the worst tragedy because every single one of those deaths is preventable. And part of what I want to do and why I'm talking to people like you is I want to help prevent. If I help prevent one person from trying to take their lives, then, then, I'm, then, I'm, then my mission is, is, is worthwhile. Then all the time I spend doing this and talking is worthwhile. What's that future look like for you in terms of, uh, I, I agree, I think you can provide a lot of help because you have that lived experience and your perspective is so valuable. Uh, are, you are you involved in um, like um, speaking? Uh, are you doing any of those kind of things at the moment? I've given a couple of talks yeah. um, to, to a few organisations, um, but I'm not, it's not like I'm out there trying to promote myself. I don't have a website. I don't know. It's just yeah. organic, right? Yeah. So it's just been an organic evolution, even talking to you is yeah. because somebody introduced me to you because they had heard me speak yes. at another another organization. So if these opportunities arise, I will do it. If a, if a company comes to me and says, come tell your story at uh, – you know, to my staff or to, and talk about resilience and talk about, you know, bouncing back and, and that kind of thing. I'm happy to do that. I, I won't take money for it. Um, I, I've got a job, I earn a living. Um, and that's, that's not what I want from this. It's just, I just want to be able to give back in some way. I'm really lucky. I'm a really lucky bloke. Mm. I'm lucky to be alive and I'm lucky to have, the family and support around me. And I want to be able to share that in some way with, with other people. Yeah. Well, as I said, I think, um, you know, there's a lot of people that would get a lot out of your story. I think, um, particularly the piece you touched on before about just the mindset of someone, um, when they're going through the, those last few decision-making processes before in a suicide attempt, uh, a lot of, I think there's a lot of misunderstanding there about what that thought process looks like. So, uh, yeah, I, I'm excited to see, um, I guess, the positive impact your story can continue to make in the community. And I'm very grateful that you came on and shared it. And I think, um, you know, I, I'm very for, very happy that you're you're still with us. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Andrew. I really appreciate that. And it's, it's, it's been great to come here and talk to it. And I just want to say one other thing. We don't, you will notice in this talk that I never used the phrase commit suicide once. Mm. So we don't use that phrase anymore. And I want to get that out in society okay. that we do not use that phrase. Yeah. Cause commit is, is, is what the term commit suicide was. It was a legal term because when suicide was a crime, commit murder, commit a robbery, right. Okay. Commit suicide. So yeah, we don't use the word commit suicide anymore because it's not a crime yeah. and people who take their lives 
aren't committing a crime yeah. and it's not criminal. So what's the it's sad? What's the vernacular? What's we, are they are they, We use the suicide as a verb. So yeah. somebody has suicided, or yeah. or we attempt suicide or suicide attempt, attempt to attempt. take their yeah. lives. Okay, but we don't use that word. Don't say anymore. commit. You don't say commit. It's just you know, it's not about political correctness. It mm. just has the wrong connotation. That's fair. So yeah, I don't want another person to take their lives in Australia if I can help them. Well, those numbers are insane, isn't it? Um, you know, and is that increasing year on year, the number? You know? <sighs> the numbers vary. Look, the last figures, as I said, I saw were in 2021. Mm. Um, I don't know what happened yet. We don't have figures for 2022 and obviously 23. I think COVID would have had an impact. There mm. was a lot of um, undiagnosed mental health issues during uh, lockdowns. Um, the stresses that put on people above and beyond uh, what lockdowns and 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 this is not a comment on lockdowns but lockdowns and and the stresses that the pandemic put upon society didn't result in people committing suicide it was that on top of everything else that was going on in people's lives that exacerbated the existing stresses yeah the existing stresses that made them even worse that caused people during that time mm. to take their lives and I, I, I would imagine there might have been a bit of a jump, uh, but I'm, I'm just guessing now mm. during you know, 2022, 2021, 22 because of, you know, what was going on. But, you know, I can't say for sure. But, yeah, I mean, either way, it's still way too many. So, One's too mm. many. Mm. It's, it's prev- these are entirely preventable deaths. Mm. Don't have to do it. Whether you're a teenager, where you're – and it's just, you know, it's also about just acceptance. You, Robin Williams – said once that everybody is fighting a battle you know nothing about. Mm. Be kind always, quote, unquote. Just be kind. You know, every, uh, everyone you see on the street, Dave, you see somebody in there and they're begging with a cup on, outside Woolworths, don't think that they're just welching off society. These, somebody's there for a reason. Yeah. Nobody wants to sit on the pavement outside Woolworths with a, with a cup begging for cash. It's something put them there. Yeah, and on the flip side, you can I, I, you can meet people that are uh, very rich and successful, and still, um, you know, their whole life is is hell. They've got going through absolute turmoil and wanting to end their life. Absolutely. I mean, it's got nothing to do with where you are in society or um, uh, or, or um, you know your economic status. Um, there are there are people attempting to take their lives. Um, from the richest suburbs in in Sydney to the the the, the poorest um, you know camps in Australia, mm. uh, it's it it doesn't discriminate. Yeah, um, you know, mental illness is 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 an awful thing and can affect anyone, no matter where where you are in society. Yeah, you know, I, I was supposed to be a privileged person. You know, and uh, you know, lived in a beautiful part of Sydney. Had wife to three beautiful, successful, intelligent children who never gave me an ounce of trouble. Sure. You know. So from the outside looking in, you know, it's uh, this perfect story, but um, you never know what's going on in someone's personal life. Yeah, you, know? you look. You just don't know. My wife is 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 a counsellor and a wonderful person. My eldest daughter is a doctor. Um, my son is doing a PhD in biomedical engineering. My other daughter has got a degree in security studies and works in financial services. You look around at these three children and this family, you think, well, everything's ideal. Everything is beautiful. Look at, look at, look at, you know, he must get so much joy and happiness from his children. Why would he try and take his life? Hmm. You know? But the big but hangs out there. Yeah. And it, it doesn't matter who you are, it doesn't discriminate. And, Everyone needs help. Yeah, and I do. I look at, I, was, I used to be cocky and arrogant and there was all a mask and a bravado. But now I look at people in the street and I feel for every one of them. I'm not trying to be altruistic and I'm some kind of, you know, <laughs> some, some are a saint and I should be, you know, suddenly uh, you know, beatified or something. But um, it does. It changes your perspective when you've been where I've been mm. and, you, and you come back, you look at, People differently. I'm far less judgmental than I used to be. God, I used to be judgmental. Do you find you you just appreciate the smaller things a lot more? Um, 
you know, it's, yeah, do you appreciate this one? Yeah, I do. Yeah. I mean, as, as crazy and as um, you know, hallmark cards as it sounds, or you know, you get these people who post things on on, on Facebook, you know, just appreciate the sunrise, mm. you know. But it's true. You know, I go out and I go for a walk in the morning, and um, you know, I go for a walk on the cliffs and and Bondi, and we we'll walked the other day, and there was whales breaching. Mm. And you just look at it and I think, wow, look what I'm able to see. Just look the how wonders privileged of life. I am. Yeah. They are, I'm looking here where I live and where I walk. I'm just looking out to see and there's whales going off. <laughs> it's just, a, it's phenomenal, yeah. you know, and you just think, wow, this is incredible. This is so special. Yeah. It's not just walk past, oh, there's whales. <laughs> there were other people walking past and they weren't even stopping. Oh. I thought to myself, how can you not stop? <laughs> really Look evil. what's happening here. Yeah. This is phenomenal. Yeah, Look the at wa- these creatures. <laughs> Wonders of the world right in front of you. Yeah, and that's the little <laughs> things where, it, yeah. you know, it really makes a difference, mm. you know. Well, Craig, thank you very much for coming on and sharing your story um, and being so generous with with your story. Um, and I think, uh, yeah, hopefully it's going to help some people. Thanks, Andrew. It was great to be here. Thanks for giving me the opportunity. No trouble. It's been another episode of Shit's Gone Sideways.